I know that's a, a long section of scripture, and, and you did such a great job with those names. <laughs> those are difficult. But uh, it's necessary for the for the narrative here about what's what's going on uh, in the story, and what I'd like to address today, this third Sunday of Lent. During the time that Debbie and I were in Pennsylvania, uh, during the last year that we were in Pennsylvania, I was leading a small group of, of men in a study of the 12 steps of a program called Celebrate Recovery. There were six of us in this group, and we were slowly becoming a group that was growing close to one another and, and to God. In January of last year, we took a, the study took us to 1 Kings, Chapter 19. That Thursday night meeting became kind of a revival that night for those sitting there in the, in the church's library. And it was because of a question that God asked Elijah when he was on the mountain of God. Elijah had just come from a major victory against the evil forces that were controlling Israel. He'd shown God's strength over the prophets of Baal by a display of, of God's power on Mount Carmel. However, Queen Jezebel heard what happened and ordered that Elijah be hunted down and killed. This week, the third Sunday of Lent, I want to talk about something we're all familiar with. Where is God in the midst of the hardest days? When Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, he was seen with two people, remember? He was seen with Moses, who embodied the Old Testament law, and Elijah, who embodied the prophets of the Old Testament. We'll talk about Moses some other time, but I'd like to concentrate today on Elijah and his experience on Mount Sinai. Even though Elijah's story is found in the Bible, it doesn't mean that he had life figured out. Really far from it. He experienced a wide range of emotions, from ecstatic exhilaration to the depths of despair. James chapter 5 tells us that Elijah uh, is, was just a person, just like us. Events in his life, it seems to me, read like a modern day case of burnout, really. Before we look at, at chapter 19 of 1 Kings, let's look at the story that happened just before. Ahab was on the throne of Israel for 22 years. Suffice it to say, he was a bad king. If you look at the record of the kings of Israel, you won't find any good kings. But Ahab was the worst, probably the worst. Uh, 1 Kings 18.30 said he did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. Verse 31 says that he married Jezebel. That was one of his biggest problems. She was an evil woman. She introduced or continued Baal worship in, into Israel, and she was the real power behind the throne. They teamed up in their, their wicked terror. Verse 33 uh, tells us that Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the other kings before him. J. Oswald Sanders said, Elijah appeared at zero hour in Israel's history like a meteor. He flashed across the inky black blackness of Israel's spiritual night. And Chuck Swindoll said that Elijah uh, plunged full force into the midst of this era of gross evil and wickedness. It was a terrible time in the history of Israel. We don't have time to, to uh, summarize Elijah's life today, but we can suffice it to say that he saw God do one miracle after another. If you want an interesting read, read chapters 17 through 19. About it. Read it for yourself. Chapter 17 shows... Uh, how God sent ravens to feed him and how God miraculously uh, provided food for him and the widow during the drought. Elijah even raised the widow's son from the dead. In chapter 18, uh, he had a showdown with 850 pagan prophets and he called fire down from God, from God 
uh, from heaven and, and uh, he wanted to draw people's passion back to God. But he expended so much physical, spiritual, and emotional energy. We see um, about four sources of despair in uh, Elijah's life. And they are often found in our lives today. See if you can fit one of these categories. The first thing is kind of a surprising thing is Elijah was depleted by victory. He was really pumped up after this, this victory on Mount Carmel. In his jubilation, it says in, in 1 Kings 18.40 that he is running like Forrest Gump ahead of Ahab's chariot from Mount Carmel down to Jerusalem. It's about 20 miles. And, uh, you know, 30, 32 kilometers, something like that. And it's not just a road. It was some pretty rough terrain probably. And, and he couldn't wait to receive the public recognition that he deserved. He was on a spiritual high. He had been on a mountaintop, mountaintop like the disciples on the, in the, during the transfiguration. Now he came down off the mountain to go to Jerusalem to, to show how powerful God was. And he thought maybe that when he got there that, that he would be able to take care of Jezebel too. But verse 1 says, Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he'd killed all the prophets with the sword. I would have liked to have been there to see Ahab tell Jezebel that. <clears throat> Ahab was probably really impressed by this. Jezebel wasn't. Jezebel began to, began to burn with anger. And this is a principle that we all need to remember. One of the most vulnerable points in our life is right after we've experienced a mighty victory. When we come off the mountain, we often go right into the valley. The second thing was he was disconcerted by fear. Instead of being impressed with what Elijah had done through the power of God on Mount Carmel, Jezebel was monstrously angry. She flew into a rage and wanted Elijah dead. May the gods deal with me, if be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that one of, one of them. In other words, she said, Elijah, you're a dead man. For some reason, this terrified Elijah. He was overwhelmed by this thought. And his faith was overwhelmed. In his panic, he lost his handle on, on the power and the provision of God. Even within hours of this huge victory, he forgot and he was afraid. Elijah should have laughed when she said, her gods. They had just been exposed as being powerless. Remember the altar that Elijah had built and the prophets of Baal were running around cutting themselves, screaming and wailing and nothing happened and Elijah all he did was <coughs> say a simple prayer and the altar was consumed by, by God's fire. Now he was knocked flat headed into an emotional tailspin Fear had replaced his faith. His focus shifted from God to the problem. So he tucked his tail between his legs and he ran like a frightened dog all the way down to Beersheba. That's about as far as you can go in Israel. And then once he got there, he went another full day's journey into the wilderness. The threat from Jezebel had shaken him to the core and instead of praying for God's help nowhere does it say that he asked for God's help he 
did like he'd always done before, he ran. Remember, the only thing that, that Satan has on you is fear. 1 Peter 5, 8 is a good reminder. Be controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Satan is able to cause fear. We run because of, because of fear, and when we run, we get into trouble. That's what happened to Elijah. The third thing is he was disabled by isolation. Elijah was in emotional overdrive. He was driven. He was fatigued. He was tired. He had already run 20 miles to Jerusalem and then another 70 or 80 miles probably to Beersheba. Might not have been quite that far, but it was a long ways. So he was fatigued, tired, burned out, anxious, running on empty. And then he left his companion in Beersheba. Someone who had been with him through all the good times. One of the great dangers of depression, and listen carefully, one of the great dangers of depression is the tendency to turn inward. Let's admit something. Many of us do the same thing. When we're hurting, we withdraw from others. Instead of reaching out, we pull inside. And then we wonder why we feel so alone. He was also devastated by self-pity. He ran for a, an entire day, and he finally found a, a tree and collapsed in its shade. In this despair, he, he prayed that he might die. He finally asked God for something. He asked for his death. I've had enough. Take my life. Let self-pity cultivate a victim mentality within himself. He had succumbed to the poor me syndrome. Look at me. Look how bad my life is. Self-pity mauls its way inside our minds like a beast in closet to shreds. That's what Chuck Swindoll has said. Elijah had completely forgotten that God's presence was with him under this scraggly desert tree just as much as it had been on the top of that mountain just a day or two before. In this state of despondency and, and dismay, Elijah, utterly exhausted by his own exercise in self-preservation, he finally just went to sleep. I know that some of you have been through some incredibly difficult times. And like Elijah, you may feel like giving up, thinking that you don't have any more to give. You may feel like you've tried to do the right thing, but you just don't get anywhere. Before you give up, I want to show you the process that God used that brought Elijah through his situation helped him regain that emotional margin, that emotional per, uh, perspective in his life. Burnout and depression is real, but it's something that's reversible. Elijah was given four prescriptions that have great application to our own lives, but only if you're willing to take the medicine. Prescription one, This one might surprise you. Instead of, of telling Elijah to suck it up and just get on with his life, God knew the most important thing that Elijah could do was rest. God didn't give him a sermon to preach or shower him with shame. Elijah had collapsed under the tree and fallen asleep in total exhaustion. And because God loves us, he's with us at all times, and he even knows our hiding places. 
Psalm 139 says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even your hand, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. Verse 5 says that God sent an angel to Elijah who said, get up and eat. And when he looked around, he found some from some fresh bread and some bottled water. I don't know if it was bottled, but it was fresh water. <coughs> bread that had just been baked on hot rocks. Imagine how well that, how, how good that tasted. He ate all the bread, he downed the water, and he went back to sleep. And after some more sleep, the angel came back and told him to get up and eat some more. Remember the angel said, eat what you have here because the journey ahead will be difficult. Our bodies are designed to rest. You can either wait until you're totally maxed out, uh, like Elijah was and collapse in total exhaustion, or you can take a healthier approach and begin to incorporate proper rest into your life. Don't be afraid to slow down the pace of your life, and that's kind of what we're trying to teach during this time of Lent. Try to set aside time every day for quiet and rest, just for you. And that doesn't mean sleep necessarily, it just means something that's restful for you. Prescription two is rediscover God. When you're emotionally exhausted, it's easy to think everyone is against us. When we no longer have emotional perspective, even God seems distant. People seem distant. Any hope seems even more distant. After regaining his, street, his strength, verse 8 tells us that Elijah traveled for 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Mount Horeb. Well, you know, this is a, it was a long ways, perhaps several hundred miles, several hundred kilometers. There's no other way it should have taken him 40 days to get there. Fear caused Elijah just to wander around more than he needed to. The same is true for us. When we're afraid and discouraged, we tend to wander aimlessly, and it takes much longer to get where God wants us to be when we're not paying attention and we're hopeless. And once, in, once he finally got to uh, Mount Sinai, he went into a cave and spent the night. And this is where God asked him the question, what are you doing here, Elijah? God knew the answer. God knew why Elijah was there, but he wanted Elijah's answer. God wasn't asking because he needs information, but because he wanted to provoke a response. <clears throat> Elijah gave a, a kind of a shaky answer, really. It seemed like a, like a canned answer. Everybody's against me. Everybody hates me. Guess I'll go eat worms. It's kind of like that. But he was still in a real shaky emotional state. God decided that Elijah needed to rediscover the divine and told him to come out of the cave and stand on the mountain because God himself was going to pass by. <laughs> this is the same mountain that God appeared to Moses. But since he was still feeling down, Elijah stayed in the cave. He didn't have the emotional resonance to stand out in the open and wait for the Almighty to make an appearance. He, he probably didn't think there was much chance of that happening anyway. Where's your cave? What's your cave? What cave are you in this morning? Are you in the cave of offense? Are you mad at God? 
Are you mad at someone else? Have you withdrawn because you're secretly angry? Are you in the cave of despondency? Are you feeling numb and isolated from people and places? There's another cave that a lot of us spend time in. It's called the cave of comfort. Some of you are wrapped up in your own comfort. And as a result, you've become insulated from the desires of God and the needs of others. There's probably more caves. So when Elijah was in the cave, this violent rushing wind came and it swept across the ridges. It roared down the canyons and over the tops of the mountains and stones and boulders came loose and crashed down upon one another. But the Bible said that God wasn't in the wind. There was an eerie earthquake that ripped through the entire area, causing gigantic rock slides and cracks everywhere. But God didn't reveal himself in the earthquake either. This was followed by a furious fire that consumed everything that was growing on the mountain, but God wasn't in the fire either. Not in the earthquake, not in the wind, not in the fire. Then it happened. The wind was gone, the earth stopped trembling, and the fire died out. And there was complete silence and stillness on top of the mountain. That was probably pretty unsettling. We can handle the noise, we can handle the chaos, we can handle the, the destruction that goes on around us, but we can't handle silence when we're in this cave. And in the intensity of that, that silence came a whisper. It was the voice of God. When, Eloy, when Elijah heard that voice, he got out of his cave of self-pity. Verse 13 tells us that he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. That's reverence by the way he covered his head. <clears throat> that he was awestruck by the revelation of God's holy and sp splendid whisper, a whisper. The events on the mountain were the catalyst that brought him back. God. See, like us, Elijah needed to come out of the cave so that he could rediscover God. He needed to learn that God was with him when things were good and that God was with him when things were tough. God doesn't always keep us from going through difficult times, but he does promise to go through them with us. Hearing God's whisper reminded Elijah that God was still in control of the circumstances. If we want to rediscover God, it's important to slow down emotionally. God is hard to hear when we're so swamped with other things. He doesn't always appear to us in a big display in the sky. He makes himself real by letting us know that he's right here right here but we have to be quiet enough to hear him God's power is not in the wind not in the earthquake not in the fire his power is in his word that, that still small voice of God quiet whisper that, that was so holy that, that Elijah in his deepest despair cover himself. It was so powerful that it changed his entire focus. Many of us need to rediscover God through the pages of his word where he speaks in this gentle voice. Prescription three. Reassignment. Now that Elijah is rested and has rediscovered God, he's given a third prescription, a reassignment to serve others. Anoint Hazael, king over Aram. Anoint Jehu, go over to Israel and anoint uh, Elisha to succeed you as prophet. 
do this, do you, do you see this progression here? He, before he re rediscovered God, Elijah was focused only on himself. Now he's back on track spiritually. And God gives him an important assignment. As if God is saying, I've got things for you do, to do. There's a place for you. God wanted him to make a choice of godly action based on obedience rather than inaction based on his emotions. God knows us better than we know ourselves. And that's why he told Elijah to do something. It's either it's easier to do your way into feeling than to feel your way into doing. And he was eager to go and help others because his perspective was in the process was in the process of being restored. This this reassignment was a fresh start for him, a new start, but he had to get out of the cave. God's whisper, that one whisper had made him twice the man that he ever had, than he ever was, and he was amazing. Are you consciously putting other needs, others' needs first? Are you involved in the lives of people to such an extent that you're able to meet those needs? Are you serving? Are you, are you making a difference by using your God-given abilities, your spiritual gifts, to strengthen the church? If you took your spiritual assess, uh, gifts assessment and attended the ministry fair, it's likely that you may be realizing where you need to be in ministry. If you want to want to increase your emotional energy, then take your eyes off yourself. Take your eyes off your problems and develop an other's direction. Be amazed on how this will fill you up. Never, you've never been designed to do everything on your own. Remember Elijah said, I, uh, I've been zealously serving my God. I've done all these really cool stuff for you. But now they've killed all the prophets and now they want to kill me. God shatters that. He said, yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel. All those whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and all those mouths who have not kissed him. Elijah felt like he was alone but he was actually part of a team. There were 6,999 other believers. He had forgotten to count while he was sitting in the cave of self-pity. The last prescription, and I promise I'm almost done. You should never believe a preacher when he says that. After pre prescribing rest, so that we can rediscover, rediscover God, we then receive an assignment to serve, reassignment to serve people. The final uh, prescription has to do with relationships. Elijah was alone and isolated in his despair, and even though he was rested and he had rediscovered God, he was still alienated from others. He was a long ways from anybody. God provided him a genuine friend in Elisha. Verse 21 describes Elisha as a personal attendant of Elijah. He ministered side by side from that point on until Elijah was taken up into heaven. And then Elisha went on without Elijah. God has designed all of us with a need for relationships and to live in community with others. Hebrews 10.25 challenges us not to minimize the importance of meeting together with other Christ followers on a regular basis. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. There's perhaps no more effective way to relieve emotional pain than to be in contact with another human being who understands what you're going through. Just as God led Elijah to a friend so too, his desire is for you to, and me is to cultivate some authentic relationships with others. 
Some of you are living with no emotional perspective because of, of some fractured friendships in your life. Broken relationships are a razor across the ar artery of the spirit. If, if you're experiencing some conflict right now in, in, a, in a relationship, do what you can to make it right. Don't wait for the other person. True reconciliation is one of the most powerful of all human interactions. If you need to forgive someone, then, then do it. If you need to ask for forgiveness, then do it. Do whatever it takes to restore your relationships. Don't let pride get in that way. Pride is a sin. God reversed Elijah's burnout by meeting his basic needs needed rest and nourishment so God provided sleep and food. He needed a fresh understanding of who God is so God revealed himself by gently whispering to him. He needed a proper perspective of himself, a sense of purpose, so God assigned him a task he could handle and finally God needed some close relationships with others so God provided a friend for him. You see, God provided all of that and he'll do that for you. But let's face it, many of us are tired. We're burning out, we're flooded with obligation and responsibilities, with family, with all the things that, that life does to us. We're running like mad on this treadmill of life. But God wants us to slow down. He wants us to reach out to him so that he can adjust the speed of our life. I want to close with two questions. The first one is for those of you who have not decided yet to follow Christ. Your question is found in 1 Kings 8, 18, 21. Here's the question. How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. That's your choice. Some are indifferent to Christ. That's exactly what happened to Elijah when Elijah gave that same invitation. Elijah, the greatest prophet that Israel ever saw, asked an invitation, but the people said nothing. Move away from apathy and follow Jesus. Second question is for those of us who are believers and is found twice in this passage. Verse 9 and verse 13. God asks this question twice. And he asks so of you today. What are you doing here? When I was sitting in that meeting with those other five men, never once did I think that in less than a year from that moment, I would be the pastor of a church in Korea. That question changed my life. It can change yours. I finally understood. I finally understood that I can do very little of value on my own. What are you doing here? Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for offering to carry our burdens. Thank you for the peace and the joy that you can give in our lives. Thank you so much, Father.